Good evening. Within the past couple of hours, the Italian Prime Minister has announced restrictions on movement across the entire country in the most drastic response yet to the spread of coronavirus. The measures include a ban on all public gatherings and all schools and universities will be closed. Giuseppe Conte said the measures were necessary to defend the most fragile members of the community and he declared that the best thing for Italians to do was to stay at home. In Italy, the death toll has risen by nearly 100 in the past 24 hours and there are more than 9,000 confirmed cases of coronavirus. Our correspondent, Mark Lowen, has the latest now. We join him in Bologna. Hugh, tonight, Italy, a founding member of the EU and one of the world's most visited countries, is facing the most dramatic restrictions it has faced in peacetime. Two days since much of the north was quarantined, coronavirus cases continue to soar. And so now the restrictions have been extended to cover the whole of the country, covering cities like here in Bologna that thought they'd escaped the worst of it. The virus is outpacing attempts to control it. Bologna was today out of the red zone, no longer. Italy, all of it, is now under the most severe restrictions since the Second World War. Public transport will still run, but the Prime Minister has told people to stay at home except for urgent need. La decisione giusta oggi. The right decision is to stay home. Our future is in our hands. We must be responsible. There will be no more red zones, no more zones one and two. The entire Italy will be under protection. We will avoid movements across the entire country. Applying for false permits to move around will be a criminal offence. Schools and universities are closed until early April. All sports matches are cancelled. Italy is now a laboratory for how to stop this virus and ease the pressure on doctors like Elena. It's an emergency situation. I may be asked to work in a department where there's more need. We've never faced anything like this and we're not ready. One of Europe's best health systems is creaking under the weight, seriously short of space in intensive care. All medical staff leave has been cancelled. We got through to a doctor in quarantined Milan. It is very difficult to forecast when we will have the breakpoint of the epidemic, the, the, the peak of the epidemic. We are near to the collapse in the most organised part of the, of the country. New measures to limit visiting rights caused riots in prisons today. Several inmates escaped, seven died a microcosm of the drastic pressure Italy is now under. The virus surging, an economy battered, and now nationwide quarantines. It's a combustible mix. Hugh, it's still unclear how these restrictions will actually be enforced. Over the past couple of days, as we have travelled around the perimeter of the previous restriction zone, we have not seen police checkpoints. Flights have operated in and out of the country. So we wait to see tonight just how much of a shutdown this really is and whether it really can begin to contain the coronavirus outbreak. Mark, many thanks again. Mark Lone with the very latest there for us in the city of Bologna. Well, stock markets around the world have fallen sharply during the day, with share values marking the worst day since the financial crisis of 2008. Trading was briefly suspended in the US United States because of the turbulence there. It followed a drop in oil prices, which compounded the growing economic concerns around coronavirus. Our economics editor, Faisal Islam, has this report. The opening bell at the New York Stock Exchange. The smiles didn't last trading having to be halted after just four minutes, in which time the Dow Jones index tumbled 7% or nearly 2,000 points. A market that's full of anxiety about the potential economic global slowdown due to the virus, which I don't even think we've seen yet, and you end up with a perfect storm. That's what we have in there today. It was part of the knock-on effect of the global spread of coronavirus to 100 countries around the world. Global falls started in Asia, spreading to Europe, where Italian markets slumped 11% today, German markets were down 8%, and in the UK, the FTSE 100 also tumbled 8%, the sharpest fall since the financial crisis a decade ago. 
these extraordinary moves in global stock markets matter not just because of the impact on your pensions and investments. There are impacts on government budgets and business spending too. There were also historic moves in connected markets such as oil and in government borrowing too. And all this matters because of what it reveals right now. Understandable uncertainty about the actual outbreak of the virus, but unpredicted consequences of how nations respond economically and diplomatically. Today's moves were triggered by a collapse in oil prices after top oil producers Saudi Arabia and Russia fell out over the impact of the virus leading to slumping demand for oil. Both are now pumping crude into the market. President Trump blamed that spat and the fake news for the sharp drops, adding it was good news for consumers filling up their cars. But today's fall does suggest a scepticism that world leaders have got a grip of the crisis. Markets don't have much confidence that governments and central banks are going to be able to um, support the economy through this coronavirus uh, epidemic. Uh, I think there's a worry that central banks don't have too much scope to cut interest rates and there's a concern that governments will be too slow to stimulate the economy. This is not just a trading panic. The markets asking big questions about not only the speed and effectiveness of efforts to contain the virus and its economic impact, but also uncomfortable trade-offs between the two. Faisal Islam, BBC News. Well, earlier this evening, Israel announced that all travellers entering the country would be required to quarantine themselves for two weeks to try to limit the spread of coronavirus. The Israeli leader, Benjamin Netanyahu, said that it was a difficult decision, but the measure was essential to safeguard public health, he said, and the decision will apply to foreign citizens from Thursday. Here in the UK, a fifth person has died of coronavirus on the day the government outlined the latest stage of its response to the crisis. The chief medical advisor for England warned that anyone showing even minor signs of respiratory tract infections or a fever will soon be told to isolate themselves for seven days. It's the next stage of tackling the outbreak, which is set to spread in a significant way within the coming fortnight. As of today, there were 319 confirmed cases in the UK. Almost 25,000 people have been tested so far. Our health editor, Hugh Pym, has the latest. Tonight's message from Downing Street. Events may be moving fast, but they're taking their time, working out the right types of intervention to be used to try to stem the tide of the coronavirus. While it's absolutely critical, uh, it's absolutely critical uh, in managing the, the spread of this virus, that we take the right decisions at the right time based on the latest and best evidence. So we mustn't do things which have no or limited medical benefit, nor things which could turn out actually to be counterproductive. But officials announced one significant change to advice likely in the near future. We are now very close to the time probably within the next uh, 10 to 14 days, when the modelling would imply we should move to a situation where we say everybody who has even minor respiratory tract infections or a fever uh, should be self-isolating for seven days afterwards. Two more patients in the UK have died with the coronavirus, one in their 70s at New Cross Hospital, part of the Royal Wolverhampton Trust, the other an individual at the Epsom and St Helier Trust, both had underlying health problems. Elsewhere in Europe, Italy faces a huge challenge with the whole country now effectively under quarantine. But other countries have seen a surge in case numbers. In France, there have been more than 1,200 with 19 deaths. There's now a ban on all gatherings of more than 1,000 people. In Germany, case numbers are above 1,100 and two have died. The government's also considering stopping large public events. Spain has seen nearly 980 cases and 25 deaths. Madrid's authorities have closed schools and universities for two weeks. One expert told me she thought the UK's response, without any such bans or closures, was well judged so far. But the European figures could be a sign of troubled times ahead. These are countries that we would anticipate as being able to contain a virus like this, or, or at least uh, this kind of spread of infection. So it, it is concerning that they've struggled to do it. And I think it suggests that once there is the development of ongoing person-to-person -person transmission within a country, it becomes much harder to stem the tide of this infection. 
Off the Californian coast, a cruise ship carrying some people who've tested positive for the virus headed for port. The mood of more than 140 British passengers and crew was much improved. They've been told they'll be tested and if there are no symptoms, will be allowed to board a special flight set to get them back to the UK on Wednesday. Hugh Pym, BBC News. Well, a number of major sporting events have now been postponed because of the virus. France has called off its Six Nations rugby match against uh, Ireland in Paris, and Italy has postponed its game against England in Rome. But most sporting events here in the UK are still going on for now, including one of the highlights of the racing calendar, the Cheltenham Festival, which starts tomorrow. Let's join our sports editor, Dan Rowan, uh, who's there for us. And Dan, what, what's the latest thinking there? Well, Hugh, 60,000 race fans are expected to come through these gates for the first day of the festival tomorrow, and as many as almost a quarter of a million across the next four days. Cheltenham is on, and that's because the government has made clear today that according to their medical advice, there's still no reason why large-scale sports events should be closed or cancelled. But, of course, elsewhere, sport is being badly affected. In the US, a major tennis tournament was cancelled overnight. The third Six Nations match of this season's tournament was today postponed. And across Italy, all sport has been suspended this evening. And, of course, inevitably, that has raised questions as to whether it's right here in Britain for sport to continue as normal. Now, today, sports bodies and broadcasters were summoned to a meeting and told to ready themselves for sport to be ordered to go behind closed doors. But I think it's fair to say the government are concerned on two levels. One, that it may cause financial ruin for many sports clubs, especially in the Football League and also in rugby as well. And secondly, that it could be counterproductive if all it does is drive fans to enclosed spaces like pubs where the virus could spread just as bad, if not worse. So this is a very difficult decision, but there's a sense it's coming and it's not a matter of if, but now when. Dan, many thanks again for the latest there uh, in Cheltenham. Dan Rowe and our sports editor. Well, with me is our health editor, Hugh Pym. We heard from him earlier in the uh, report there. Can we talk about the advice that was given today, Hugh, and the kind of change in advice and the change of tone as well, really? How significant was that? Well, Hugh, potentially significant. Right now, the position is only if you come back from one of the worst affected countries on the list and develop symptoms, do you then self-isolate and contact 111. Now, Chris Whitty, the chief medical advisor, has said within a couple of weeks, it's very probable we'll move to a different set of guidelines for anybody with these symptoms, no matter where they've been, for example, a dry cough, a cold, a, a temperature, to go and self-isolate. Now, that change, I think, uh, is significant because it's saying that they expect coronavirus cases to carry on rising, seasonal flu to fall away. So you might as well get everyone to self-isolate for seven days after the first appearance of these symptoms. Tonight, obviously, we've been talking about Italy and, and the drastic measures announced there by the uh, Prime Minister earlier this evening. Uh, Boris Johnson was asked very pointedly earlier today, you know, the country's taking very, very rigorous measures. Why aren't we? Now, what is the answer they're giving you to that? Well, very dramatic move in Italy. The British government position is, and of course there are far fewer cases here so far, is that different countries will do this in different ways. Right now they're weighing up the social cost of big interventions and the timing. There's no point going too early with bans. You can't then take it off the table if it doesn't work to begin with and you lose public confidence. So they're weighing all that up, but I do sense that we're not that far off from some sort of announcements of interventions to try to stem the... Uh, growth of this virus. Hugh, once again, thanks very much. Hugh Pym, our health editor there. Well, as the international community struggles to contain the spread of coronavirus, the World Health Organization has praised China for its response, suggesting it offers a model for others to follow. But inside China, there's anger over the way that the authorities have handled the outbreak, with censorship being stepped up, uh, the very approach that experts say helped to accelerate the spread in the first place. Our correspondent, John Sudworth, has more details. In this message, a medic complains about the quality of protective equipment. The video is now being blocked on the Chinese internet. This one's been taken down too. A daughter crying out for her dead mother. Ever since China silenced Dr. Li Wenliang, who tried to warn about the dangers of the virus and later died from it, the censorship has been increasing. 
The WHO asks these questions. But the World Health Organization insists it's not its place to criticize. We are epidemiologists, not litigators. Uh, we know that the country has identified that there were shortcomings. It is not WHO's role at this stage. Our role is to really help with the positive lessons of moving forward. In China, focusing on anything other than the positive can be dangerous. This reporter records a few final words before opening the door to the police. Leadzer Hua was detained, it seems, for trying to report independently about the virus. But now, efforts are underway to capture and save some of the censored information. China is repeating itself back to what happened like during SARS. One of the anonymous like researchers like tells me China keeps and making the I same think. mistakes. During the SARS virus in 2002, censorship was also rife. They were trying to hide the information and that's why people lost lives. China wants the world to focus not on how censorship may have cost lives, but on the strengths of a system that has now brought the epidemic under control. And the WHO seems to agree. What do you think of the, the criticism that China's political and economic clout makes it very difficult for the WHO to, to criticize? There is a large epidemic uh, happening. We have seen how, through a concerted national effort um, at the top level of government, has flattened that epidemic and gained the time for other countries to learn those lessons and not to have the, to face uh, that same issue. Some Chinese citizens are unconvinced that anyone should feel grateful for the efforts of the party. A point being made by the professor in this video. It's been blocked. John Sudworth, BBC News, Beijing. And uh, you can keep up to date with all the developments concerning the coronavirus outbreak, including the symptoms to look out for and lots of background and scientific expertise as well on the BBC News app and on our website, bbc.co.uk.